Jessica Vincent, Partnership and Sponsorship Manager for Antenna International. Jessica, over to you. Hello, good afternoon. So, today I'm going to be talking to you about um, the low-hanging fruit, or what uh, both myself and my company, Antenna International, um, think of as low-hanging fruit and why we're not picking it. So, just to give you a bit of background and kind of explain our perspective, Antenna is the world leader in mobile interpretation for the cultural sector. So we deliver um, audio guides, multimedia guides, smartphone applications, podcasts, to a number of the world's most visited and most iconic cultural attractions. Um, so we create audio and multimedia content on the platform of choice, and that's really important. So we try and, we'll go on to it later, spread our bets a bit in terms of working with user-owned devices and also devices that we build ourselves specifically for um, the cultural sector. And with this, we focus on the pre-visit, in-visit, and post-visit experience. So we try and create a kind of virtuous circle of visitor engagement with institutions, which hopefully will keep them coming back, keep them spending money, and keep them engaging with um, the messages of the institutions we work with. So we think that mobile is a real ha low-hanging fruit. And I think it's, it's safe to say that actually mobile interpretation as a revenue stream is tried and tested. Antenna has been in the business for 30 years, and a lot of our key clients consider their audio guide or their multimedia guide that you can pick up at the site as a significant uh, re revenue source. So this is a brief snapshot of um, the uh, museum mobile landscape as it is now. So on this side, there's a couple of devices that we've actually um, created specifically for the sector. Our favorite audio-only guide up here we know you can drop that off a battlement of an English heritage castle and it will survive, which is very important when you get the French school trips coming in the summer. Um, here we've got our uh, new multimedia device, which is Wi-Fi enabled. It has a touch screen. It also has a keypad to cater for the broadest possible audience. Um, and then moving over to the other side, you see we've got smartphones. Um, apparently 10% of the world's population now owns a smartphone. So I think that in itself is a reason to be looking at this as a significant uh, revenue generating tool. And in the middle there, um, you've probably seen in the press about um, the new Nintendo 3DS um, appearing in the Louvre uh, next month, I believe, to host their new multimedia tour. So that's an interesting uh, signal that actually consumer devices are moving into the art sector as a way to reach a wider audience um, and, and tap into that market. So, why do we think it's a low-hanging fruit? Well, as I said, 10% of the world population apparently has a smartphone. But also, in the cultural sector, I can tell you that every year, 62 million people pick up one of our devices at one of our sites across the world. That's a big number, and it's people that are actively engaging with content, wanting to learn more. Um, we also have um, a number of apps on the App Store at the moment, um, and so we're, we're trying to cater to these big numbers um, below 5.9 billion mobile subscribers worldwide. So it seems silly not to be exploiting these numbers and really looking at mobile as a, a genuine tool for creating new streams. So, and this is what we can do with them. So some of these things are more traditional than others. Obviously, audio tours, I'm sure you've taken the National Gallery audio tour, the British Museum multimedia tour, and they are genuine uh, revenue-making um, opportunities. Social networking and sponsorship vehicles, perhaps more of a marketing tool, but actually, if you're marketing out to a new audience, hopefully they're going to come into your institution, buying tickets, buying merchandise, so it's all bringing in more money for your institution. Now, we're going to look at a couple of case studies now um, from Antenna's experience. They are specifically related to um, the museums and galleries sector, but hopefully you can see some affinities with, with other sectors as well. So the National Gallery, we've worked with them for over 10 years now, and we have a huge archive of audio content and multimedia content from their um, permanent collections, from their temporary exhibitions, from their podcast series, 
And so in 2009, we sat down with them and we said, right, you know, smartphone apps are making headway. We think we should do something. So we came up with Love Art. It basically focuses on key masterpieces in the collection, and it integrates different pieces of content to give you a comprehensive guide um, to that specific artist or artwork. Uh, it's received over 280,000 downloads um, across 75 countries, and it's available in English only. Um, interestingly, there was a big, uh, uh, big download figure from Korea, um, so I think it shows that there is an appetite for, you know, for the arts out there. I'm not sure whether um, that many people speak English or you know, what the population is, but it's, it's really um, interesting uh, to look at, look at the breakdown. Um, so in order to create this, we went through our archives and we looked at the assets we have. Now, theoretically, we have a huge amount of assets. But in reality, it is very, very difficult, we found, to repurpose content that might have been created five or ten years ago. It's not to say that the content isn't as, as um, relevant now as it once was, but actually it's more that we haven't necessarily cleared it initially for internet distribution, for a smartphone dis distribution, simply because we didn't know Apple was going to start taking over the world. Um, we didn't know how significant this would become. So we had to go through the archives and we had to look at, or use what we had, I should say, which was knowledge. We had the knowledge of our archives, we knew the assets that we have had, whether it was an interview or a, or a quote, we knew how to pursue that particular asset and clear the rights for that. Now, interestingly, we actually took the option to uh, re-record a lot of the content, um, simply because the tone, we wanted a consistent tone, so it felt like a, a comprehensive package, not something that had pulled from our 10-year ten, ten archive. And because we did this, obviously there was um, some upfront investment involved, but actually it's been one of the most successful marketing campaigns we've been involved with and has been a really fantastic thing um, for the National Gallery. So thinking about uh, uh, IP and the issues with repurposing content, this is another example of how we use an application, um, but for, with, the, with the Royal Academy and the Degar exhibition, we actually use what we call integrated thinking, which is something we're really keen on, which basically means that when we're creating a project, we, we have the foresight to clear the rights or, or create um, a slightly different angle on the content, which means that it can be redistributed in different ways. So the Degar exhibition uh, was at the Royal Academy, I believe, at the end of last year. And when you went to the exhibition, um, there was an audio tour that you could pick up there and, and rent it as you went around the exhibition. We decided from day one to create a multimedia app to accompany this. Because we decided from the very first moment, it meant that we could work with just one script, um, which it sounds a really simple thing, but it could have caused a lot, of, um, a lot of more expense if we'd had to create a new one. So this one script might have had alternative sentences, things like on the audio guide, it will say, look at the painting in front of you, uh, on, the, on the app, it will say, look at the painting on your screen. But those slight changes really make a difference and really mean that we can record it in one go and then our sound team, sound designers, sorry, can cut and edit and create something very, very simply. Um, obviously, this application hugely extended the reach of the exhibition because even though the, uh, the exhibition actually finished um, a couple of months ago, the app is still live on the App Store. So it's creating that longevity for the experience. It's creating, um, enhancing the post-visit experience and it's keeping um, the visitors engaged or indeed those people who were never able to visit the exhibition. Again, it's not to say that it's not without um, some additional costs and things though. To create um, the timeline, as you see here, some picture galleries, the interface design, you're looking at another sort of three to four weeks worth of work on top of the audio guide that we'd already created. And just to touch on the pricing. So, if I just, sorry. So for Love Art, um, we pitched it as a free app for the first three months and then we started charging for it. This enabled us to get the reach um, of the market and people started downloading it very, very quickly and then we started charging to create some revenue. Um, Degar has been charged from day one at £1.99, but I think it's fair to say it hasn't had quite the reach of, uh, of Love Art for the National Gallery. 
So we're just going to talk about business models. So when creating something like an app, it's always difficult to work out whether you're looking um, whether you want to pitch it as a free or a paid for app. There are arguments supporting both, and actually it comes down to reach versus revenue, I think. Um, for a free app, the reach will be greater. People will just download it like that and not even think about it. And actually, um, Pinch Media, um, according to their research, says that as a category, free apps tend to be used 6.6 .6 times more often than paid for apps. So that might mean that your visitors or users are engaging uh, more deeply with the content or simply that they're dipping in and out, um, as you might not do with a paid for app. But obviously, just because it's free doesn't mean, I mean, sorry, because it's free, it's obviously a fantastic marketing tool and actually getting people into your institution may be the thing you're looking to achieve um, to up revenue through ticket sales. On the other side of it, for paid apps, consumers will pay for content. And I put a rather extreme example on here, um, just, to, just to show you, you never know what's going to happen. So the I Am Rich app was launched on the iTunes store in 2008 for the cool price of $999.99. By all accounts, the app does nothing. All it does is sit on your iPhone and show that actually you're rich enough, slash stupid enough, to buy this application and have it sitting on your phone. Now, interestingly, eight people bought this application before Apple took it down. So, I'm, I mean, extreme example, but people will pay, whether it's for a marketing thing, um, for themselves perhaps, or, or, you know, they will pay for content. And I think um, it just goes to show you never know what, what the market's going to do. And I can assure you that Armin Heinrich is a very happy man right now. Um, so, one of the business models that we're seeing as a really um, interesting one that's emerging is the freemium. The idea that you give people a freebie and they will pay more, uh, they will pay, sorry, for more content if they like it. So, 72% of revenue um, comes from apps featuring in-app purchases. Um, this is from uh, uh, Destimo about the Apple's, Apple's app store. Media, um, media companies are doing this really well. So people like The Guardian, they might give you the headline um, stories and then you, you pay to get more content. I actually think this is a really nice fit with, um, with the arts sector, the idea that you can hook someone in with a, you know, maybe a piece of content, maybe an image um, from a gallery, and then if they want to learn more, if they want to create more of an experience, they have to pay for that. Um, I would also like to point out here that in the Android market as well, um, they launched the in-app purchases in spring 2011, and by September 2011, 68% of the revenue from the top 25 grossing apps was coming from in-app purchases. So it is genuinely making money for these <clears throat> four people. The only thing is, Apple and Android will take 30% of your on-sales. So it's, it's a bit of a balance. But being able to integrate um, an on-selling function is really interesting, specifically for things like e-commerce. And the mobile, uh, mobile as a tool is a fantastic um, platform for e-commerce and for sponsorship. Now, we've started um, dabbling in this a little bit. Last year, we did a project um, with a print-on-demand partner. So you were at a museum, and on your um, multimedia guide, and it was an, a guide that was available at the gallery, not a personal um, device where you download the app, you, you picked up the guide, and you, could, you were standing in front of an image, or a picture, rather, and you could click to buy a print, just like that, because you were, in, you were engaged with that piece of art, and you, could, you were in that kind of um, motivated mode, and you could click to buy. Now, that's a really interesting um, opportunity, I think, and something that actually we had some really great feedback on. Um, obviously, this can link to merchandise, tickets, as well as the additional content or whatever you want to on-sell through your, through your device. Um, and in terms of sponsorship, I'll just mention briefly, we, as, as everybody is aware, the you know, big... Big commercial sponsors are very interested to align themselves with the arts. And actually, mobile is a really interesting way to do so because it's so, it's so interactive and it's so, it captures a motivated audience when they're in, in the mode of engagement. And you see here a couple of examples. So uh, BNY Mellon sponsored the Degar exhibition, so they were fully branded all over the application, which obviously had more of a global audience because it was on the iTunes app store. Um, in, this is from the Milwaukee uh, Art Museum, where Cole sponsored 
an interactive kids tour um, at the museum. And again, because it's on a mobile device, it's very interactive. Um, it can be blazoned with their logo. So it's a really interesting proposition for sponsors right now. So before we start picking the fruit, I think these are the key things that we really need to think about. And actually, as I said, hopefully some of the examples have struck a chord with your institutions, but the most important thing really is the motivation behind it. If you're looking at using mobile, why? And who is driving it? If it's your marketing team or your educational team, then maybe, maybe a free, free content is perfect because actually you're just trying to get your audience engaged or you're trying to get them in the door. If you're genuinely looking at a revenue stream, um, then actually maybe you need to think about um, the others very, very clearly. So assets, how feasible is it to repurpose content? Do you have assets that can be reused, that give the right message across, that have the right tone? It's very important that you get um, that right because actually, as I'm sure most of you know, the, the reviews of apps on the app stores can be very brutal. And unfortunately, if you get one really bad review, then some, you know, it will really put people off. Um, commercial appetite, as I said, sponsorship and e-commerce, fantastic tools, but are they right for your organization? Do they fit with your brand guidelines? All these things are very, very important when, when modeling it. And operations and audience are probably almost part of the same thing. So it's really simple things like, do you have, are you Wi-Fi enabled in your institution? Because if you're not, if you're creating an application that you want people to use while they're there, then actually it's going to limit the size of the, of the app because, as you know, 3G, you can only download a certain amount. And if your audience is international, say, and they come over, they're not going to want to get on a 3G network and, um, and uh, get landed with a huge data roaming charge from their mobile phone when they get home. Personally, I always turn my phone off as soon as I get on a plane because I'm simply too scared um, in case the bill comes the next month. Um, and also your visitors. So the tried and tested method of an audio guide in museums, as I said, does work. And actually, it appeals to a wide demographic of visitors. If you're looking to broaden out to perhaps younger, younger generation, then fantastic. A smartphone application may be the way to go. Integrating the social networking links um, will also support that and create a community around your institution. And to be quite honest, most of the multimedia tours we do now, probably about 99% integrate social networking links as standard. So I'm not sure if that has confused a few, uh, a few ideas or, or helped, helped uh, iron out some of the issues, but ultimately there are key considerations um, when looking at mobile as a platform, but the opportunities are just huge. And there seems to be a new device coming out every week. And um, I think it's really important to keep track of that, keep track of the numbers who are using mobile. And for some institutions, a tried and tested audio, multimedia content, even podcasts, are a very, very simple way to either get people into your institution or push pushing your message, message out, or actually looking at ways to integrate revenue. Thank you.